Good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to translate a lesson about the intramural and extramural vegetative system and organ and fascia units. This lesson has been held by Luigi Stecco on the 3rd of November, 2021. You can find the original lesson in Italian on the fascial manipulation YouTube channels. So we can start. And uh, for starting, we have to summarize a little bit what fascia manipulation offers in order to understand what we are talking about today and what we will talk about in the next lesson. So we have a fascia manipulation that is a, a, the real a perfect combination of a fascia uh, biomechanics and the nervous system physiology. We can understand better how our body works if we understand how it is uh, uh, moved by the fascia system and how it is moved by the physiology of the nervous system. Both of these systems uh, cooperate uh, each other in order to let us move in a proper way. And we will see there are mainly two divisions. One is, uh, is the locomotor apparatus, so that we study um, in depth the locomotor apparatus. And uh, here we study the physiology of the voluntary nerves. The other part is when we talk about the internal apparatuses. And so we have to discuss the autonomic nerves and how they uh, work. So in the first part, we have the first level that is more related to the movement therapy or kinesi therapy. And uh, we study here the basic of the movement. So we study how the epimesial fascia, the perimesial fascia help the system to uh, move into the free planes of space. And here we see that the coordination of the basic movements are made by the center of coordination that are uh, points in which the forces of the movement are coordinated by the epimesial fascia. And we will see that there are also points of perception, center of perception, which are periarticular uh, sensor which are uh, able to detect if the movement is made in a proper way. And so we can change and compensate the movement if it is needed. Then there is the second level. And here we are talking really about the physiotherapy because here we are talking about the global movement of the body. So the body is gonna move uh, through pattern, pattern of movement. So it is a way that the body used to put together many plans of movement. So not only the three uh, basic plans, but uh, uh, how to move from one plan to the other plan. And this is uh, um, relate in relation to the Golgi tendon organs and uh, uh, the points that we call the center of fusion. I mean, it is means that there, there are plans uh, of the fascia that uh, are more in relation with the fusion of uh, many parts of the muscles, which uh, allow us to pass from one plane of movement to the other. And we will see that the fascia are made uh, in, in a different structure also. Uh, fascia can uh, be found uh, in a diagonals or spiral fibers, which uh, can permit us to take a different kind of movement that is not only on the plane, on the one plane. And here we are talking about the receptors that are uh, in uh, the retinaculum, and uh, they are most of all free nerves endings. So we are talking about uh, aponeurotic fascia <coughs> and the retinaculum. So these are the levels about. Uh, the voluntary nerves and the locomotor apparatus. Then we are talking about uh, the third level and the fourth level. These are two levels that are more involved in the study of uh, the internal apparatuses and so the autonomic nervous system. The third level is what we are talking about today, is more related to the peristalsis therapy. And we are 
going to talk about this in a minute. But uh, in a few words, we are going to talk about the intramural neurons web. And so we are talking about the tensor structure and the extramural neurons web. So we are talking about the catenaries and distal tensors. Here, we will study a lot the internal fascia, the containment fascia, and the insertion fascia of the viscera. Then there will be the fourth level, and Luigi is going to have a lesson about the fourth level, the reflex therapy, in, uh, on the 1st of December 2021. So uh, keep an eye on the website in order to be prepared. And in this level, we are talking about uh, the superficial fascia, the adipotomes, the angiosome, and how treating the uh, superficial fascia will affect the external uh, system and the internal system, because we are talking about influencing directly the paravertebral ganglia, which are more related to the external system, and the prevertebral ganglia, which are more related to internal system. So uh, this level will be really interesting to understand uh, uh, the behavior of our body in order to maintain the homeostasis. And the level of today uh, is really important to understand how the uh, connection between the locomotor apparatus and the viscera is uh, involved in our control system. So let's go ahead. <clears throat> the peristalsis therapy uh, is a new uh, conception, is a new term that uh, Luigi used in order to uh, let us understand what is going on in the studying this level. So it means that through an action on the container, we can change or we can influence the peristalsis of the internal organs. And we are going to see why this can happen and uh, why it is uh, in this way that uh, the body uh, can work. So peristalsis therapy works on mobility dysfunction of the organs and internal apparatuses. <clears throat> internal organs are united in organofascia units. So, uh, each organ has the organ itself and all the fascia that surrounds and makes the structure of the organs. We will see later uh, as uh, the stomach example. And also all the fascia of insertion that take the organ into the same place inside the trunk. And so each levels of the trunk, uh, each segment, uh, we're talking about the neck, the thorax, the lumbar region, the pelvis region, are a kind of um, structure that are called a tense structure, uh, in which there is the organ with in, uh, the inside fascia and the insertion fascia. So the container fascia of the organ and the insertion fascia of the organ that are inserted into the trunk. So this is the organ of fascial units. Internal apparatuses instead are united in three apparatus fascial sequences, which are the visceral apparatus fascial sequences, the vascular and the glandular apparatus fascial sequences. And these are the union of more organ of fascial units into more tense structure, which are related to the catenaries, which are the um, fascial uh, con continuity of the tensile structure in the locomotor apparatus. The trunk fascial densification can interfere with the peristalsis of the organ fascia units and with the apparatus fascial sequences, leading to intra and extramural ganglion dysfunction. It means that <clears throat> If uh, we have this tensor structure, we have the organ fascial units that is uh, in relationship with the outside of the tensor structure, and we can have uh, uh, more compensation of this tensor structure on the other part of the catenary. If there is a densification on the outside, 
this can be uh, a problem of the uh, transmission of the forces of the internal fascia. So an external densification can make some problem for the internal part. So it can make a, a problem for the rhythm of the organofascial units and the apparatus sequence unit. So for understanding better <clears throat> this uh, example, we have to understand better the autonomic nervous system and how it is uh, uh, viewed in uh, classical Western medicine and how it can be uh, better understand uh, in a fascial manipulation perspective. So we can start uh, uh, for the classical Western medicine. We can see here uh, the Saladin book uh, that has been written in uh, 2019. So it's a pretty near uh, to us. <clears throat> and there is a, a statement in this book that is not so uh, modern. We can see uh, it is from Eustachio from 1563, so some years ago. <laughs> and uh, it is a statement about uh, the autonomic nervous system and I will read it to you. The autonomic nervous system is formed by two subsystems, sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. So we can see that from that time, almost uh, 500 years, nothing has changed. We still have the same kind of idea of autonomic nervous system. This can be because uh, uh, it is true, it is like that, or because maybe sometimes we miss something. We can see <clears throat> later uh, the Chiaruji statement is talking about the metasympathetic that includes the extensive complex of fibers with microscopic ganglia in the nodal points contained in the wall of the viscera, vessels, and glands. So Chiaruji, almost 400 years later than Eustachio, He's talking about another kind of sympathetic uh, nervous system that maybe can be more uh, uh, easy and more useful to understand. If we miss this part, we miss uh, maybe some kind of uh, proper information about our physiology. So today we are going to understand it a little better. <clears throat> so. The metasympathetic, uh, if we consider the gray uh, anatomy, gray is one of the most famous book around the world. So we can see what uh, gray say about metasympathetic. The visual nervous system includes area of the central and peripheral nervous system responsible for innervating the viscera, vessel and glands the term autonomic nervous system used for convenience is not very appropriate. Its autonomy is illusory. So Grace say that there is a visceral nervous system that is put inside the, the visceral system, but, and this is the metasympathetic system, but it is really connected with the central nervous system, as you can see in the image, by a lot of connection, uh, the vagus nerve, the, or the chain of uh, or the sympathetic nervous system. And so in a gray point of view, the nervous system of each organ is uh, not autonomy because it is in relationship with this kind of connection. But they are not all about this kind of convention. In every book, uh, it is said that uh, if we cut off all this connection, think about a new kind of uh, uh, treatment of Parkinson's disease that is uh, trying to cut off the vagus nerve. But if we cut off the vagus nerve, we cut off a way of uh, conduction from the gut to the brain. And this, uh, uh, some uh, research, is trying to understand if this connection is a base of Parkinson's disease. So they cut the vagus nerve. So 
if we cut off the vagus nerve in a grace perspective, all this connection of the vagus uh, is not uh, um, giving the inf good information to the organs. So if the autonomy of this organ is illusory, then they won't, they won't function, they won't work. But instead they work because they are autonomic. And we will see that in Kerugi's book, we can read the autonomic nervous system is independent because when the connection between the central nervous system and the peripheral portion are destroyed, the structures innervated by it can still perform many of their function. So if we cut off all this connection, the viscera can still perform their function. What is happening? All in, in this image of Kerugi, uh, we can see there are lots of connection and uh, all, the con all the innervation of the organ seems to be really in relation only with the connection of the central nervous system. But uh, there are lots of uh, neurons that are inside the organs itself. So, these are the intramural nervous system or the intramural ganglia. And these are uh, autonomic in, in a, a way that they work based on what happens inside the viscera. The connection with the central nervous system is a kind of a, mm, disturbance. It means that when there is a problem in the outside world, so there is a tiger, oh, I was eating something. Okay, mm, usually when eating, I should then rest and digest. So the parasympathetic. But if uh, I'm eating and there comes the tiger, I have no time to rest and digest. I have to go and uh, fight or fly. So I have to stop the energy for digestion and I have to run, run away. In this way, the connection with the central nervous system is a kind of disturbance of the autonomic regulation of the organs because they can stop the energy for the digestive system and make the, the energy useful for something else like fight or fly. So when they do a heart transplant, it is not necessary to take all the heart plexus, which is really huge, but is enough to take just the heart and the his and the and Tawara uh, ganglion are still working on their own. And the connection with the central nervous system are just a way of changing a little bit the rhythm of the heart, but the, the heart itself has its own rhythm and it is influenced by the connection with the central nervous system. And we can see that, uh, so Kerugi is uh, in a good way, good perspective, but he still has a, a lot of uh, importance on this kind of a connection. And uh, in the page of Kerugi uh, book, we can see that there is only one page talking about the metasympathetic. So there are lots of pages talking about the vegetative system, but there is only one page or less than one about metasympathetic. So it's really, he is pointing in a good direction, but he is missing something. Why he is missing something? Because as always, fascia is not uh, considered in a proper way. So, if we consider the fascia, we can understand better how this system works. The containment and insertion fascia for classical medicine are not so important. Usually we can see this kind of uh, image where we can see the peritoneum, the serous membrane that lines uh, the abdominal cavity, which surround the single viscera, the visceral peritoneum, and fixes it through the mesentery. so here. But usually uh, they are not considered so much the internal fascia because each part 
how the fascia is divided into smaller one, which uh, uh, surrounded not only the viscera, but also they are inside the viscera. They are uh, inside the walls of the viscera, giving them a different kind of uh, form, shape. And they are what gives the, the vascularization of the organs uh, a good structure. The vascularization can go inside the organ, inside the, an organ like the liver, just because there is a good uh, uh, structure of the fascia, the connective tissue that surrounds all the uh, little vascular uh, parts of the liver. So if we see the interaction that there are between the container and the contents, we can understand better how these uh, uh, fascia are important for a fascia manipulation and for understanding the good physiology of our system. So here uh, we can look at, at this, uh, this section. This is the pericardium. And uh, we can see that it is not isolated, but has a lot of connection with external. These are the sternopericardium ligaments. There are lots of connection with the ribs. There are lots of connection with the column here. There are connection with the vertebra, the cervical vertebra up, up here. And so there are lots of co connection with the container. If there is a, a densification of the container, this can generate a stretch on the internal connection fascia. So the uh, insertion fascia which is really sensitive to the stretching. And uh, this can uh, be a kind of alteration of the internal organ function. In this case, we can have some kind of arrhythmia because of a stretch of the pericardium that is uh, pulling the heart in another direction. So if the um, stretching of the pericardium is made by a uh, constriction of the outside fascia, we can understand what, what is happening here. So sometimes the arrhythmia, if there is not a, a clear pathology, can be in relation uh, to the container that is not so uh, in a good situation of tension, okay? <clears throat> we can see that every organ is uh, fixed in the body uh, by some kind of insertion fashion or suspension fashion. Uh, here is a, a, an image from the new book. And we can see here the example of the stomach. Uh, this is the new book that is uh, already going to come out on the third level, and there will be more on the on the next book that will be on the fourth level, and it will be available uh, from January. There will be a clear description of the connection of each organ with the container. Here we can see the stomach connection. So we can see that uh, it is connected uh, on the upper part with the diaphragm uh, for the cardias. Then there is a, a connection with the free uh, part uh, of the great omentum that is uh, trying to balance uh, the connection with the diaphragm. So we have an upper connection and the lower connection. Then there is a, a left and right connection with the gastrolienal ligament on the left and the gastropathic ligament on the right. Then there is the, the retro, the posterior part that is linked to the lesser omentum. And then there is the gastrocolic ligament on the anterior part. So the stomach is really suspended in the space with all this connection. And each internal organ has its own retaining fascia and various insertion fascia. The organ is suspended with elastic fascia that support it in the free planes of movement. So each organ is suspended in the anterior posterior uh, movement. Then it is uh, suspended and uh, uh, it can move in the lateral, lateral movement, lateral, lateral plane. And then there is a, a suspension on the oblique movement of the organs. So uh, the same time, leave it free to move. So this fascia 
helps to maintain the organ in the in the good place, but also helps to let it free to move in a different direction. The insertion fascia are the transmission belts between the container and the contents. So let's look at the microscopic system uh, that is called the metasympathetic system. So the enteric or intramural nervous system consists of about, consists of about 100 million neurons arranged within the walls of the viscera, vessels, and glandular duct. It has its own reflex arts. It is said by Saladin, again, in uh, 2019. But how it works, it is not said. So if uh, uh, we, not, we are not considering the fascia structure, we miss uh, the interpretation of this function. Saladin say that they work for reflex arcs. But it's not clear how this reflex, these uh, reflex arcs works because uh, there is not a, a clear uh, way of a reflex arc in the viscera because probably it is not a reflex arc, but is a kind of different uh, working. So if we look at the microscopic system for fascia manipulation, uh, fascia manipulation try to explain this. We have to analyze the microscopic nervous system. So there is a, an intramural vegetative system that are all these uh, 100 millions of neurons that are inside the walls of the viscera. It, it is made up of small ganglia joined together by the plexuses that form the intramural neuro, neural networks, that is the metasympathetic. It provides for the peristalsis of the single segments of the intestine, vessel, and glandular duct. So we imagine the, the wall of the viscera. There are many layers. There is one layer that is the serous. And here, the serous or the serosa is uh, uh, as inside of itself uh, a lots of neurons that are made about uh, like a web. Okay. And uh, when something passes through the viscera, this web is uh, uh, expanding, so it's stretched. And this stretch makes the uh, viscera react to the stretch, and so there is a contraction. Then there is the extramural vegetative system that is made up of small cluster of vegetative neurons the extramural ganglia, specific for the peristasis of the organofascial units and of the apparatus fascial sequences. So here we can see better. We have the intramural microscopic system, in turn, is divided into the hour back meanteric, located in the muscular level, the mesner submucosal separated from the meanteric and placed at the surface of the mucosa. The neurons of the intramural or metasympathetic system are in, in direct relationship with the connective and muscular tissues in which they are contained. So here, yeah, the, um, the image is from the, the, the book uh, of um, Saladin. And as we can see, it is really well uh, drawn, but each layer is really well separated one from each other, as we can see here. But if we take Kiruji's statement, instead, he says that the neurons of intramural metasympathetic system are in direct relationship with the connective and muscular tissue in which they are contained. So as an example, we can look here. And Saladin draws the intramural plexus separated from the serosa. Instead, Kerugi says that these are in direct connection with it. So it is clear that the structure of, the connection of connective tissue is fundamental for the function of the metasympathetic system. So here, Saladin is making this description for uh, uh, just teaching, because uh, 
it is more uh, easy to understand it if they are separated because it's also difficult to draw all together. So it's more didactical. It's more for teaching, for make us understand. But the reality is that the intramural plexus is directly inside the serosa and inside the muscular level of the organs because the function of the metasympathetic nervous system is directly connected to the structure of the viscera. So the function is directly connected to the uh, structure and the structure is made by the connective tissue. And what happens here? You see, for uh, uh, make uh, it easier to understand, uh, sometimes we miss always something. You can see here, this is diaphragm, and this is the hiatus esophageal, esophageal hiatus. And in Saladin book, it is uh, drawn like uh, they are separated. They are uh, two different things, two, two really different things and have nothing in common. But if we consider the esophageal hiatus completely separated for the di from the diaphragm, we cannot understand how the diaphragm can interfere with the um, uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Because as we can see in this image uh, uh, that comes from Benningoff, uh, we can see that Benningoff has drawn uh, in a correct way because he understood this. The esophageal fascia is in connection with the diaphragm. And in this way, we can understand how diaphragm can influence the autonomic coordination of the cardias. If the diaphragm is too tight, the cardias cannot be correct closed. If we see in this picture, imagine that diaphragm is really tense in this way and this way, because the diaphragm tension is in this way, how the cardias can react in a proper way. It cannot close. It cannot close properly. So we can have gastroesophageal reflux. So in the previous image, the esophageal fascia does not connect with the diaphragmatic one, but the gastroesophageal reflux can only be explained by this link. So when we miss the good structure of the fascia, we miss many of the function of the internal organs themselves. And if we, uh, look at the fascia structure, we can understand what the tensor structure are. And here we can see here, there is a sense, the tensor structure of the neck, thorax, lumbar, and pelvis. And we can see the diaphragm, for instance, that uh, makes a lot of connection with the thorax and with the uh, lumbar part. And uh, this, uh, the diaphragm is connected with the ribs, with the sternum, with the dexifoid process, so ribs, sternum, xiphoid process, and then the cardias that pass through the diaphragm can uh, uh, have a better function if the diaphragm have a good function. But if the container is too tight, then the coordination cannot be possible. Because if there is a, a, a container, the thorax, for instance, that is too much tight, so the diaphragm cannot uh, relax and cannot uh, uh, stretch, cannot be relaxed. So the, the part of the diaphragm through which pass the, the esophagus cannot be relaxed and the cardis cannot close. So, and then think about the, the hole because the diaphragm is not suspended like this, but here there is the heart and there is the pericardium which connects the diaphragm to the upper cervical part then there is, a, down here, there is the liver that is a, a big, a heavy glands that uh, is uh, attached to the diaphragm and can influence the diaphragm. And there is uh, the glissonian capsule of the liver that is going through the diaphragm in touch with the pericardium. So there are lots of connection of the fascia that uh, make us understand better how the body, the whole body can interact on itself and can 
make some problem on the function of uh, each organ fascia units. So again, to understand the internal fascia function, we can uh, understand it by uh, understanding this kind of experiment. So um, how internal organ works? Valdisera says that through local reflexes, again, we don't understand how these reflexes uh, comes, the distension of the intestinal wall determined by the presence of the chyme causes the contraction of the smooth, of the smooth circular muscle fibers upstream and the, re the relaxation of those downstreams. It doesn't talk about fascia, but if we don't consider fascia, this experiment would not be possible because if it works as a reflex, then if we take a, a part of the intestine, we cut it and we reverse this part of the intestine. And uh, if uh, it happens, uh, the physiology of the intestine happens uh, with a, a reflex, then if we take this part and we change direction and we put it again into the flow of the intestine, then the reflex should be always the same if uh, the nervous connection are always the same, but it is not. If we reverse this part of intestine, then the peristalsis doesn't work anymore because the structure of the fascia is what make this work. So if we change the structure, we reverse, then the, the peristalsis cannot have been uh, in a good way. So the intramural ganglia are the same in each part of uh, the internal organ. So it's the same for the visceral part, for the vascular part, for the glandular part. Each intramural ganglia, intramural neurons are always the same. How can they work in a different way? They can because the difference is in the, is in the structure of the fascia. And we will see it better a little later. So how it works it works with the system of the mechanotransduction because uh, like in the stomach we will have a, a different uh, structure of dif for different function so when uh, the nerve the the meanteric uh, plexus in this in this uh, example is stretched uh, by the food in this case, or what uh, is going uh, inside, uh, the restrained fascia activates the intramural ganglia because uh, the fascia is stretching. So the intramural ganglia, the intramural neurons sense it and transform the mechanical uh, information into electric information. And this electric information that is already translated from mechanical information goes to the central nervous system. But the transformation is uh, uh, in the periphery. So the viscera itself changed the mechanical stimuli to electrical stimuli and uh, act with the electrical uh, stimuli directly. So we can see it better into the stomach. Stomach is uh, not only a sac. The stomach has uh, many layers, many muscular layers, and so many fascia layers. Remember you that the formation and the, uh, the distribution of the muscle fibers are related to the distribution of fascia fibers. So in the stomach, we can see there are three muscular layers with three different direction. One is longitudinal, one is circular, the other, the other one is oblique. And why it happens? Because the, the function of the stomach relies on the mechanical function. So uh, the food that comes inside stretch the longitudinal fascia, which uh, excites some uh, kind of intramural ganglia that activates some muscle fibers. This activ the activation of the uh, longitudinal fibers 
will stretch the stomach on the other direction. And so the circular fibers will be activated and the activation of both uh, longitudinal and circular fibers will activate also the oblique. And uh, there will be a kind of a mixture that uh, happens inside the stomach. But uh, what happens now? Uh, the stomach in this way could uh, uh, continue to mix the food for uh, uh, longer, for uh, ever. What happens now? There are some uh, uh, theory about what happens. And one theory is uh, the uh, hormones or chemical theory or the nervous theory. The chemicals say that uh, when there is a, a kind of uh, chemical and hormonal activation of the stomach, so related to the gastrin and the histamine of the stomach and the, the pH, the, the acidity of the stomach, then the stomach uh, gives a signal of releasing the pylorus and so the stomach can be emptiness, can, be, can empty itself. And the other theory is that uh, the, there is a center, a central vagus control, and then the vagus give the, the order to open the pylorus. And so uh, the stomach can empty itself. But if we cut the vagus, as we already said, uh, this, uh, the, the, empty, the, mm, the capacity of the stomach to empty itself still works. So it is not from the vagus. Then uh, uh, the pH, yes, could be. The, sure, the, there is a part of this, but uh, what if the patient take lots of uh, gastroprotector in order to lower the acidity of the, of the stomach? There is uh, no acidity anymore, or there is not so much acidity. So the stomach cannot open because uh, there is no more acidity there must be something different. And uh, uh, the bending of say something like this, the emptying of the stomach is determined by the different in pressure between the antrum and the duodenum. The pylorus form a functional unit with the antrum. So here is not uh, completely, but uh, there is already something more related to the structure of the stomach, and we will see that it is uh, the really important part. So we are going to understand now how the extramural vegetative system uh, are important for this. The emptying of the stomach, like other factors, is permitted directly by the extramural ganglia, which are included in the lesser momentum in this case. For the classical medicine, the extramural system is the vegetative component arranged outside the wall of the organ. For fascia manipulation, the extramural system is a comprised uh, between the microscopic ganglia located in the insertion band, while the microscopic ganglia include the paravertebral and pervertebral ganglia. So we see that the organ fascia unit is uh, coordinated by the extramural ganglia. So we have the microscopic extramural ganglia that are usually considered as divided, as derived from the vagus nerve. So usually we see the vagus nerve comes down and uh, uh, is in relation with the, the extramural ganglia. But usually we think about uh, this as a, a, der a derivation of the vagus nerve, but it is not. There are the extramural ganglia and the vagus nerve comes on the extramural ganglia in order to give them impulses. So what happens uh, in this, kind, in this uh, example? It happens that the extramural ganglia here can feel the stretch of the stomach and they are more on the little curvature on the stomach because it is the part that it is more stretched if the food uh, uh, is enough. So here, the nerves can feel the most the stretch of the organ and can react to this. The little curvature, so is the part of the stomach 
which can sense the stretching more and so give a charge accumulation because the extramural ganglia can sense the electrical stimuli. But how they works? They works uh, for an accumulation effect. It means that while uh, we have uh, many examples of uh, biochemical accumulator, like uh, Saladin said, the adipose tissue store triglycerides to return them when we need it. So this is a, a biochemical accumulator, but there is also the electric accumulator. It is like a battery. <clears throat> and uh, this is a device capable of storing electrical energy. And this is what happens with the extramural ganglia. So there, when the stomach mix the food, it mix, mix, mix. And this uh, mixing gives uh, information of a stretch of the uh, small curv curvature of the stomach. And uh, the, all this uh, stretch impulse goes to extramural ganglia. And when the extramural ganglia reach a kind of uh, limit, then uh, it gives uh, the, the discharge in order to open the pylorus and to empty the stomach. So this is a, a resume uh, summary of the stomach function and the intramural and extramural ganglia. So the passage of food stretches the fascia of the single organ. <coughs> the stretching causes the intramural neural network to be activated resulting in an electrical discharge, discharge. The discharge causes the small muscles of the bowel segment to contract, and the stretching of the intramural fascia spreads to the fascia of the mesos. And so all the coordination of the organofascia units and the apparatus fascia sequences is uh, uh, permitted by the coordination of intramural and extramural ganglia. And as we can see, mainly the apparatuses fascia sequence uh, are uh, coordinated in the same way, but each organ of fascia units has a different kind of uh, time, a different kind of behavior, just because of the structure of the fascia in itself. Take, for instance, the esophagus is really different from the stomach because of the structure. The esophagus transit is about 10 seconds of the food, so really, really fast. The uh, transit in the stomach is about two, three hours. And this also is really, is really slow instead. Why? The esophagus has uh, lots of uh, spiral fascia that surround it. And uh, this structure permits the transit in 10 seconds. The stomach have three layers of fascia in different direction, and this uh, not allow the, the food to go out in 10 seconds, but it needs more, okay? <clears throat> so we can see there is a, a the tensor structure in which we have the organofascial units, and we can see if the, uh, there is a dysfunction of this, this can be in relation from the outside to the inside and vice versa. And obviously the dysfunction of a single organ of fascia unit is related to the, sense, to the densification of the tensile structure. The dysfunction of an entire apparatus can be connected to the, to the densification of several points distributed on the catenaries. The catenaries are parallel to the fusion lines of the restrained fascia. The globality of the whole body, it means that the body, in an attempt to neutralize the densification of the trunk wall, seek compensation in the fascia of the limbs. So if we have a tense structure here that has lots of densification and doesn't let the organ of fascia unit in itself to move in a proper way, then in order to help uh, the organ of fascia unit to move better, uh, the tensile structure can uh, search for help uh, in the, the catenaries and with the tension in the limbs. So the diagonals of the limbs becomes distal tensors of the catenaries. 
the operator, knowing these physiological uh, strategies, has to map to find the points to be treated. So uh, we can understand how the body is compensating the problem of the organs by understanding how it is looking for help in the diagonals of the limbs. And this is a, a way of understanding the global movement of the body. When we move, we always move, obviously, the musculoskeletal system, but we move this musculoskeletal system with the apparatuses that are inside. And so we, when we move, our body has to make attention to all this structure in order to move properly. So thank you for uh, uh, par participating to this lesson and uh, I hope uh, it's, it is all clear. We wait you on the 1st of December with Luigi's uh, new lesson about the fourth level. So the internal and external system. Thank you for uh, attention and uh, see you next time.